The jury is now set for the Delphi murders trial. 16 people now selected to decide whether Richard Allen murdered Abby Williams and Libby German back in 2017. After years of their families waiting for answers, the trial is finally here and we're covering it. Samantha Johnson spent the day, in fact, inside the courtroom. She joins us live with what happened today in Fort Wayne and what we can expect as the trial moves on in the days to come. Hey, Sam. Hey, and Marie and Scott, that's right. After six more hours on day two of jury selection, we now have a full jury. In fact, the next time we see them here in Allen County will be Thursday morning at nine when they are officially sworn in for the Delphi murders trial. Now, the judge in this case told the entire courtroom several times today that Richard Allen is to stay in Allen County until his jury is sworn in. So today we saw him in street clothes for the second day in a row. It was khaki pants, a baby blue shirt. He seemed very engaged in the process again today, taking notes throughout the day, asking questions, talking to his defense team. Ultimately, in the courtroom today, they selected four women and two men to serve, all from Allen County. They'll be moved to Carroll County coming up on Thursday. Also on Thursday is when we expect to hear more information about the prosecution's new request to prevent those jurors from seeing the two composite sketches that investigators released in their search for a suspect. So take a look at your screen. You've probably seen these before, but now the prosecutor says they're not relevant since they were not used to identify Richard Allen, and he's worried that those sketches will prejudice, confuse, and mislead the jury. So Anne Marie and Scott, of course, this is a jury that's expected day one of this trial on Friday. So now that the jury is seated and this selection process wrapped up earlier than we had expected, is that going to impact the timeline of the trial, Sam? Well, you're right. Tomorrow, Wednesday, was supposed to be jury selection day three if they needed it. Tomorrow instead will be a day off. The jury will be sworn in Thursday, like we mentioned. Day one still set for Friday. And the judge was very adamant, reminding the juror several times today that this trial is expected to take about a month. As of right now, it's still supposed to wrap up on November 15th. I think it's also important to mention, guys, of course, the girls at the heart of all of this. We saw family members of both Abby and and Libby back in the courtroom today. Yeah, it's been such a long wait for those two families. Samantha Johnson in Fort Wayne, thanks so much. And remember, we've got our Delphi trial special streaming 24-7 over on WTHR+. That'll get you all caught up on all the major moments and developments in this case since 2017. WTHR+, Plus, by the way, is a free download. You can get it on Apple TV, Amazon Fire Stick, and Roku. A second former IU basketball player just came forward with allegations of sexual assault against the longtime team's physician, Brad Bamba Sr. In a new lawsuit against IU, the former player, who is now listed as John Doe, says he played for IU in the 90s under coach Bobby Knight. He says he was sexually abused by Bamba Sr. under the guise of medical examinations. So in this lawsuit, Doe also alleges that team personnel were aware of the abuse and would make derogatory and joking remarks to the student athletes about Bamba Sr.'s conduct. Last month, the university announced it was launching an internal investigation after that first player came forward with accusations. They're also asking any other IU student athletes who may have been abused to come forward. We have the anonymous reporting hotline that you can call right now, and it's posted on our website at WTHR.com. We also have posted for you there an email address where you can report and communicate as well. Angela? Anne-Marie, we do have cold air that's having an impact across central Indiana. The when tonight and tomorrow night. So think Wednesday morning and Thursday morning. The impact low temperatures in the low to mid 30s. What you need to do is bring in those outdoor plants that plants that you want to save or cover them up. We do have a frost advisory in areas south and west of Indianapolis, Greencastle to Columbus to Bedford, and it's a freeze warning north and east Muncie, Anderson, Richmond included for temperatures that will go even lower in the upper 20s and low 30s. In addition to the cold 
cold air. We've had some spotty showers, even with some lightning and some small hail today. Still have some rain over Franklin County, moving south through Decatur County, including Greensburg. Kids will need the heavy coat at the bus stop tomorrow morning. Early morning temperatures in the 30s. Sunshine still cool tomorrow afternoon. Highs in the 50s. Angela, thanks so much. Tonight at 6, we've now learned the name of the man who was killed in that shootout here in downtown Indianapolis over the weekend. Tonight, the coroner's office is confirming to 13 News that 28-year-old Charles Lovelady Jr. was shot and killed near Indiana University's Indianapolis campus. A woman was also injured. She was taken to the hospital. Tonight, police are telling us the shootout involved two cars near the Taco Bell off Indiana Avenue. So far, investigators have not announced any arrests in that case. Curbing speeding and reckless driving in the Community Heights neighborhood. That's what Indy DPW hopes to do with a brand new project next year. This all comes after neighbors did their own experiment last year. So tonight our Marion County reporter Lauren Costick shows us how a tactical urbanism project is now leading to permanent solutions. Last year, the Community Heights neighborhood set up barriers here on East 10th Street to slow down drivers, and according to their data, it worked. Now, Indy DPW says it's time to redesign this busy corridor. The East Side community was one of the first in Indy to launch a tactical urbanism project. Months of data showed the barriers and protected bike lanes reduced crashes by 74 percent, giving the city's Department of Public Works the data and roadmap to reimagine the street from Arlington to Emerson. This would be the first tactical urbanism program that uh, a community organization has done in Indianapolis that's going to lead to a, a major full-scale redesign of their roadway. The city is now setting aside millions of dollars in next year's budget for this new project, something Leslie Schulte calls a win for her community. My hope for my neighborhood is that everyone can feel safe using our public spaces, regardless of how they choose to travel. Indy DPW says it plans to start the design phase next year and also hold meetings here in this neighborhood to get everyone's feedback. In Indianapolis, Lauren Costick, 13 News. And we're just hours away now from a huge interstate closure impacting thousands of drivers here downtown. Starting tonight at 9 o'clock, all of the southbound lanes of I-65 are closing between West Street and Alabama. This is so crews can complete bridge and joint repairs. So this also means that several ramps along this stretch of road is going to close. It's expected to last 16 days. So we've got all the detour information you need to know. It's all posted on WTHR.com slash scene on 13. Right now, there are more than 13,000 Hoosiers waiting to receive Medicaid waiver services. Karen Campbell now shares the story of one family's battle with the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration. So at the point in her life when she needed something, she didn't get it. And that's what's frustrating. Jo Lynn Garing has been advocating for her late grandmother, Josephine Peters, after a long battle with the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration. What we were told is that because she lived here in an assisted living memory care unit, she would not receive long-term care benefits until she moved to a nursing home. That created financial concerns, not only for the family, but for the assisted living and memory care facility where she stayed. Josephine had dementia and congestive heart failure. She died on October 3rd, while still on a Medicare waiver wait list. She was 103. <laughs> Garing reached out to Representative Carrie Hamilton for help. We must keep calling attention to this so that my colleagues in the legislature understand that this is a dire, urgent need for us to address when we go back in January. In hopes of helping the more than 13,000 Hoosiers on the wait list waiting for help. Karen Campbell, 13 News.